In 1930, an event took place here that can never happen again on Earth. Two prospectors and their bearers entered a high valley of what is now Papua New Guinea and discovered a civilization of nearly a million people, completely unknown to the outside world. The astonishment was mutual. The villagers had never before seen humans with white skin. Today, Papua New Guinea remains one of the world's least explored countries, an island of the past little changed across the millennia. In one of their most ambitious expeditions ever, Jean-Michel and Jacques Cousteau will lead divers, scientists, and filmmakers into a world cloaked in legend. Calypso and the windship Alcyone will now converge for their first joint expedition. Destination, the eastern half of the vast South Pacific island of New Guinea. Here, foreboding images endure from a hundred generations before. Here, Cousteau teams will probe a land once notorious for headhunting and cannibalism. A land of bizarre ceremonies and bow and arrow warfare. Of cultures so diverse, they speak more than 700 languages, nearly half the languages on Earth. Here, rainforests are living museums. Creatures like the tree kangaroo, vanished elsewhere, live on. Insects of dreamlike shape haunt the jungle. And remnants of the primeval rule the lowland swamps. In the surrounding sea, a startling paradox. Along the pristine seabed, tons of metal carcasses drowned during World War II. Foreign warriors clashed here in titanic battles, leaving behind their weaponry and their bones. The liquid cemetery is once again the domain of fish, of undersea dwellers as colorful and as ancient as the human cultures above. Join the Cousteau team on an extraordinary journey to another world called Papua New Guinea. In the vast solitude of the South Pacific, Calypso makes careful passage over the coral rampart of a tiny, nameless reef. To reach the interior lagoon, the ship must find a corridor through a natural seawall, one perhaps never breached by human or vessel. The rim of coral rises here to within seven meters of the surface, but no higher. With a draft of three meters, Calypso, wood-hulled and vulnerable, glides in without peril. Whoa! 
For Calypso, it is the first anchorage in Papua New Guinea, a realm her crew has long hoped to study. From this circular outpost stretch great ranges of the sea, still largely unknown to science. The initial reconnaissance dive marks a reversal of roles. Jean-Michel Cousteau is one of only two team members familiar with these waters has explored them on visits covering 15 years. First taken under sea by Captain Cousteau at age seven, he will now introduce his father to a marine region he has long cherished. We slip into a sea of antiquity unscarred by intruders from the present. Young barracudas stream above, a predatory cloud. Unhurried now, they can suddenly attack a school of smaller fish, like warriors raiding another tribe. We enter a village of coral, perhaps amazing the curious natives jewelfish and moray eel. We play like children among living toys. Prompted by this vitality, my mind wanders back to my first dives as a child in the Mediterranean. Then, in the eyes of a boy, anemones conjured up images of the mythical gorgons with snakes for hair. Shellfish were mysterious lockets lined with beauty. The seafloor was a fairy tale setting, a spectacle surpassing artwork. But today, life still so vibrant here disappears from the waters where my father first took me diving. For us, this is a remembrance of times past. Around us, primordial bouquets, delicate cousins of starfish called feather stars, whose ancestors were among the first sea creatures without heads or brains. They have survived the ages and here still flourish. A flounder looks for cover, moving in the placid rhythm of a timeless world. Pursued, he invokes nature's ancient magic he simply disappears. Reluctantly, we return to the present. Et on aura fait le tour de cette région qui a été d'abord très diverse sur le plan culturel. In Calypso's chart room, the Cousteaux finalize expedition plans. They will send some 50 people and an array of equipment into a country of dense jungles, rugged mountains, and more than 600 offshore islands. Calypso, led by Captain Cousteau, will survey the outer islands, while a land team enters tribal areas of the interior mountains. Alcyon, led by Jean-Michel, will explore areas of the Bismarck Sea and sail up the legendary Sepik River. This night, before beginning separate journeys, the team descends in waters perhaps never penetrated by artificial light.
but for a few solitary swimmers, fish sleep along the reef. The nocturnal feeders, like the basket starfish, turn the bottom to an eerie mass of tentacles, coiling and uncoiling to snag tiny worms and crustaceans. turtle passes through our lights and, in reptilian disinterest, swims on. Dressed in poisonous spines, a lionfish stares us down, unimpressed. Around us, feather stars are fishing by night with extended arms like the basket starfish. As we watch, they grow more active. One climbs aboard Antoine Rosset, who provides a free ride without realizing it. Some erupt in frantic motion, perhaps confused by our lights. Unintentionally, we set in motion a shy chorus line that has danced these dark waters since time immemorial. Along a remote island in Papua New Guinea, little visited by outsiders, morning has revealed a surprise. In a world beyond modern technology, Calypso's arrival looms as a special event. between the sheep and the coast. Oh. On the bridge, Albert Falco and Bertrand Sion introduce space-age navigation to men who still travel in dugout canoes. Very nice one, huh? Radar holds little interest, but binoculars afford a magical vision of things familiar. <laughs> <laughs> when tours of the white ship have satisfied their curiosity, islanders return the favor, invite the Cousteau team to visit their village. From palm thatched huts, a greeting party of excited children emerges. serves as a lingua franca here, it is called a sing-sing, the supreme ceremony of welcome throughout Papua New Guinea.
Inspired by the warm reception, the Cousteau team arranges a novel treat. A generator and TV monitor are carried from the ship. Videotapes have been recorded during the day. Now they provide the villagers with their first glimpse not only of television, but of themselves on television. <laughs> As the Cousteau team finds, life here is an endless transaction with the surrounding sea. Since earliest times, benevolent provider of tools, jewelry, and protein. In coming months, the team will study local fishing techniques. Here, fish are simply corralled in a palm leaf fence, then speared by the entire village. Elsewhere, islanders have devised natural implements of remarkable ingenuity in their pursuit of fish. To most, it is merely a spider web produced to trap insects. But to Bougainville islander Joseph Ailey, it is free netting to catch fish. Collecting webs made visible by morning dew he shows Rosset how he turns fine gossamer of the forest into sturdy scoop net. At low tide, Ele can easily gather tiny fish marooned in pools by the ebbing waters. later, enough fish fry for stew, or for bait to lure a coral trout or snapper. The common looking root of a forest vine, but pounded, it releases a natural poison. As Cousteau biologist Dr. Richard Murphy watches, fisherman Rudolf Situam sets out into shallow waters along the island of New Ireland. Retreating into crevices for safety, reef fish unknowingly trap themselves beneath the poisonous clouds. The milky substance, called rotenone in the West, does not kill instantly, but paralyzes the respiratory systems of fish. It is Situam biting the heads of his victims who finally dispatches them. For the Cousteau biologist, it is intriguing evidence of human commonality across vast gaps of time and distance. He has seen a remarkably similar technique half a world away in the Amazon jungle. Aboard Alcyon, we encounter a fisherman unlike any we have ever met. His name is Selam. He fishes alone in a small outrigger his gear consists of a coconut rattle, a club, a noose, and a belief in magic, magic that will enable him to call from the deep and capture single-handedly a shark. In time-honored rituals, he summons his prey, tapping the reef, shaking his rattle.
finally, a curious shark rises. An extraordinary contest begins. Small mistake could cast Selam into the water with his furious opponent. So the shark caller obtains nourishment for his village and local renown. After all, alone in a small canoe, he, Selam of Cantu, has overcome with muscle and magic the most feared creature in all the sea. Using the coastal town of Leh as staging area, land team expedition leader Don Santee, photographer Anne-Marie Cousteau, and total crew of six prepare for a rugged journey into Papua New Guinea's interior highlands. They enter a world where human life has been shaped by the environment. In secluded upland valleys of the central Cordillera, densely wooded and walled by steep ridges, small societies develop their own languages and cultures in isolation from one another. They came to look upon their neighbors as enemies, provoking thousands of years of hostility and sporadic violence, which continues in some places to this day. In a mountain alcove, the team finds a haunting relic of that violence. Local villagers lead Santee and team translator Martin Madden to a shrine of bodies smoked some 80 years ago, still draped in remnants of flesh preserved by clay, still bearing the fatal arrows from a surprise raid. A mother seems to shield still the skeleton of her child. Exalted for defending their village, the mute figures serve now as strange monuments to a dark world of human conflict. The grim severity of life in this region was documented in rare footage shot in 1959. Recently mummified by smoking, a husband and father has died at the hands of enemy warriors. After family sacraments, his murder must, by ancient Highland code, be avenged in a ritual attack long known as a payback raid. The retribution is imprecise. Anyone in the murderous clan can be killed even a child. Here, all have fled but two girls who are quickly abducted. Seeking a people notorious for violence, the team finds progress slow over mountain roads subject to tropical rains. Yet the muddy terrain figures in the legend they will investigate, the legend of ferocious attackers called Mudmen. For generations, coated in ghostly mud, 
conducting murderous raids, they struck terror into Highland neighbors. In the village of Comuniva, Santee, Madden, and Mark Blessington find the dreaded Asaro mudmen now peaceful, but proud of their savage past. They tell the team their mud disguises horrified victims who believe the mudmen vengeful apparitions. Unrecognized during their attacks, they were spared retaliation. The Cousteau team, however, is not spared a demonstration. Though most recall the days of massacres, the times and outside influences have turned war to dance, enmity to amusement. For the team, they perform a mock killing. Now we do this for fun, he says. But before, we killed for real. We terrorized whole villages, using clay and mud to look like ghosts. We would chase everyone in an enemy village. We would chop their heads off and loot and burn their houses down, and we would even kill their pigs. Into this fierce realm, an unexplored territory of Australia at the time, came unsuspecting gold prospectors nearly 60 years ago. Remarkably, they carried home movie cameras, unaware their films would document the discovery of an uncontacted civilization. On the morning of May 27, 1930, two Australians clad in khaki and fedoras walked with carriers into a highland valley to confront in amazement a legion of men and women wearing feathers holding Stone Age weapons. The villagers had never seen a steel axe, a wheel, a white person. Some fled, some wept, believing the pale figure's ancestral spirits returned from the dead. In bewilderment, they stared at one another across the ages. Once nearly impenetrable, Papua New Guinea's mountain walls are now breached by a few dirt roads. Yet for most Highlanders, only the trappings of life have changed. Western clothing, shovels, steel axes. Outsiders are still curiosities to be inspected and helped along. The first white man seen by many here was Australian Michael Leahy, leader of the 1930 prospecting expedition, now famed with two brothers for opening a hidden world. Daniel Leahy is the only brother still living. We were prospecting and looking for gold. Gold was the only thing then, and that was the only thing that you could sell really in those days was the gold. Because that was the depression time, you know, in 32, 31, 32. Well, there was nothing in Hagen, nothing at all, <laughs> when we first came here. There was, of course, a people who assumed that their valleys were all there was of the world. 
When the first white arrived, recalls an elder, we thought he was not real, but one of our own who had changed form and come back from the dead. We were afraid he would kill and eat us. Worried that alarmed villagers might attack, the new arrivals quickly demonstrated their superior firepower. The lesson struck home, triggering an eagerness to trade for the miraculous things carried by whites, including seashells, never seen before. The first Europeans brought mother-of-pearl shells, which amazed us. The seashells became so valuable, we even traded our pigs for them. The Highlanders also yearned for steel knives and axes, goods so precious that an occasional husband was willing to provide his wife for a night in exchange. The mingling of white explorers and timid native women produced several children. One, plantation owner Clem Leahy, is the son of Michael Leahy himself and Yamka Ampwenta, only 16 when her husband brought her to Leahy. To visit her today, Clem leads the Cousteau team to the village where she still lives much as before whites arrived. When we first saw them, she says, we thought they were not human beings, but devils or sky people. But when we saw they defecated like humans and ate food like us, we realized they were just humans. There was always a good atmosphere among the people in our village. Well, my whole life here has been very good. You know, meeting the people. And I was always happy in this place here, doing what I did. It was a very interesting life all the time. Near the village of Kindo, the team learns of a rare ceremony about to ensue. A consequence of payback violence now mitigated by the modern world. An elder of the Melpa people, Karawa Kemga, is not only host but admitted murderer. Today he will offer pigs, the paramount symbol of wealth as compensation to the sons of a man he killed 30 years ago in a quarrel over a pig. The Cousteau team is granted permission to observe an event unique even in a world of the unexpected. The death went unrevenged because the Melpa, called wigmen because their headdresses are woven of human hair, had been forbidden by Australian patrol officers to conduct their traditional payback killings. Today, the matter will be settled, ending a generation of tension between the clans. In anticipation, villagers apply body paints long made from clay, charcoal, lime. Ornaments made of shells, couscous fur, dog's teeth. Oil, once derived from trees or pig fat, has been supplanted by a handier alternative. Now Kemga announces the gifts he is offering as recompense.
And 42 pigs and a sing sing. The procession will last through the night and following day. Wave after wave of dancers in finest regalia and ceaseless drumming that reverberates across the quiet valley like a percussive murmur from the past itself. Though violence diminishes here, it can still erupt over lost pings or traffic mishaps. This day, a feud will be forgotten. It is harder to bury the centuries of suspicion. In waters not far beyond Papua New Guinea's volatile highlands, Calypso journeys among islands virtually untroubled by paybacks and warfare. In Milne Bay, Captain Cousteau spots sailing craft ahead, elaborately carved like war canoes. They are instead friendly vessels that carry from island to island not only a special cargo, but an institution that has long ensured peace among the islands. They carry jewelry, fashioned since earliest times from common seashells yet of priceless value among island men. Like his forefathers, he has sailed to Iwa Island to exchange a necklace with an old associate. Rosé and Mose Richards witness a display of mock anger calculated to entertain. The two men are members of a timeless island fraternity called the Kula Ring. Each year they meet to trade insults and jewelry. And it's come back Expatriate Bill Rudd, one of only two foreigners admitted to the ring, explains the Kula system to Richards. We're all members of a club. We all know one another. And these valuable uh, items, which are jewelry, local jewelry, they travel around from member to member to member to member to member to member, and that makes a ring. So it's like a club who deals in um, objects which are precious to the members of that club. So these items here, they all have names. And a top item like this, to get this gives you tremendous prestige. Here, bits of seashell are more precious than gold. At Rossell Island, Rosé joins villagers who search the bottom like undersea miners for a treasured rock scallop. Their take venerated among islanders for centuries, is a drab mollusk known to science as Chama imbricata. Completing one necklace a day, villagers break off a red lip of the shells, grind, polish, and string the finished discs on pandanus twine. Kula members later add pendants, seeds, and a distinguished name to the shell necklace. The Kula virtually holds the society together and keeps them um, as um, very integrated and as a sort of a big extended family. Here, violence and suspicion, common to the highlands, 
is ever abated by the festive contacts and personal alliances of Kula exchanges. Prestige sought through deadly conquests in the highlands is here bestowed peacefully by the temporary possession of a mere necklace, illustrious to islanders of little worth beyond. Each year they harangue one another, demand a renowned Kula piece, feign disgust when they get it. You're the worst partner anyone ever had, he says. To give me such trash when I give you a magnificent necklace. They have been friends for 40 years, will never betray a smile, but will never raise a hand. Such is the ancient game of Kula. The peaceful Kula society, such a stark contrast to Highland's turmoil, inspires Cousteau. He wonders if new friends can introduce a necklace into the Kula. And if so, why not the crew of Calypso? Thus, a party of would-be Kula men sets out on a solemn mission. Bearing a necklace made with help from Bill Rudd, they enter Omarakana village. Hampered by unswerving politeness, Chief Falco renders a pale imitation of a Kula insult to Chief Pugliasi. So, to Kula pieces with famous titles is added one with an unfamiliar name. A necklace named Calypso. Near the island of Wuvalu in the Bismarck Sea, Alcyone comes upon creatures unexpected in these waters. Orcas, killer whales, are gliding near the ship. It is an opportunity we have long dreamed about. Our attempts to film wild orcas over the years have been frustrated by murky water and their tendency to shy away. But here, the water is clear, and the orcas linger near us. Yet, we have no idea what to expect. Usually gentle in captivity, wild orcas may be the most ferocious predators in the sea. Their reaction mystifies us. They neither withdraw nor attack, but seem to wander in lazy circles, as if on automatic pilot. We cannot know for certain, but I believe we have come upon orcas during a period of rest as they drift like airships along the ceiling of the sea. For nearly two hours, they float lethargically, occasionally peering toward me. Perhaps, though drowsy, they are deeply curious, like highland villagers making first contact with an alien race. To our knowledge, such tranquil behavior has never been documented in the open ocean. Suddenly, they disappear into the haze below us as if departing. Then, an extraordinary moment. A female returns to us, clenching in her jaws an eight-foot shark 
probably captured while hiding from the whales in deep water. She parades before us like a cat proudly displaying a mouse, a feeding spectacle never filmed before. We know she could do the same with us, but we sense in mind and heart, perhaps foolishly, she will not. Behind her, a male with a six-foot shark. They could have gone anywhere with their victims. They returned to where we waited. Perhaps we will always wonder why. To us, the encounter is further evidence that ancient ways of death and survival and duel in Papua New Guinea. How close did you get? I think we're pretty close. There was something. And then they are gone into the blue infinity of a timeless sea. <laughs> 